not your last chance to escape, but uh, I'll be talking about WebEx and how we deploy it and things you need to worry about for the next couple hours. And um, uh, when I'm talking about WebEx, I mean the WebEx meetings. Uh, you know, WebEx is now used to describe a, a lot of our cloud collaboration offers, so I'm going to be talking about WebEx meetings. Okay. Um, just to uh, just to get started, um, I would like you know, as I say, to make this interactive. Um, I have a mic I can pass around uh, if that helps, but uh, I can probably hear anyone asking a, asking a question, and I can just repeat it so that everyone can hear. Um, feel free to ask questions. I, I do have a number of slides. I'm not married to the entire deck, so uh, I can skip a few. But my goal is to help you understand uh, some of the common requirements and some of the common um, you know, problems that you might run into in deploying, mass deploying WebEx in a large enterprise. So uh, hopefully you had a chance to see the abstract. Um, and um, I guess I may, well, may as well begin. OK, uh, thank you all for coming. And I hope the session will be useful. Please let me know. Um, anything you might need during the course of this uh, presentation, and I'll try to answer it, okay? Uh, just as a recap, some of the other sessions I think that build on this or might be interesting to you, just in case. Only one of these has already um, passed. Uh, I apologize for throwing that in there. Actually, uh, yeah, it was this, uh, the Cisco WebEx Service Feature Deployment Lab. Uh, has already occurred, so everything else is still to come. Um, just to call out uh, something new that I'm only going to touch on, um, the Cisco WebEx Edge, which is the direct peering and also the direct audio, uh, the first one I mentioned. Uh, you may want to attend that one because that is relatively new. That's a, um, a product that we just came out with. Um, and also the very last one, there's a, a WebEx roadmap session that I'll be doing uh, tomorrow. Uh, in case you're interested. I'm mostly going to be talking about things that we have today, not things that are coming, and that's uh, tomorrow, okay? So this is my agenda. Um, it's a packed agenda, so uh, some of these things I will kind of run through, but please stop me if you have any questions, okay? Oh, and um, one more. Um, I did bring a number of T-shirts. If you can um, ask me a question, if you have a complaint, if you, um, you know, just uh, want to know something, I'm more than happy to hand you one of my t-shirts. I've gotten a ton. I only have two sizes, though, medium and large. <clears throat> okay, oh, um, there is a WebEx Teams room. Uh, if you grab your mobile and uh, type in this course number, BRKCOL2010, um, follow along, ask questions. Um, I'll be monitoring the room for a few weeks, and I'll have some of my um, coworkers in there as well. So uh, if you have any questions today, uh, tomorrow, next week, uh, even a couple months from now, I'll, uh, I'll read it and respond, okay? You have my, you have my word. Um, just a, I'm gonna spend this first section on um, some of the WebEx platform things that I think are common knowledge that everyone should know. For about a year now, we've moved to releasing WebEx monthly, and so you might have noticed um, we'll have like a, 33.1, followed by a 33.2 the very next month. And um, the other concept to know is lockdown versus non-lockdown. If you are a customer, and there's a lot of them, if they're on lockdown, they don't get the new monthly feature releases. So what we would like to advocate is maybe the reasons that you have a customer on lockdown, such as uh, the customer not having admin rights on their PC so that when they get pushed an update, they can't install it and that causes an error. Um, because of some of the enhancements in our software, that's no longer required, that, and I'll talk about that later. So hopefully the reasons that a customer might be on lockdown, we can kind of remove all those barriers and we can encourage them to not be on lockdown. But one of the um, hard requirements for being on lockdown came from our third-party par third audio providers, we call them TSPs, so when WebEx is not doing the audio, but rather West or you know, some other um, service provider is handling all of the audio, um, just to make sure that they maintain their software QA, they request lockdown, so they test everything, make sure everything works, have everything on one common version, and then they stay there for you know, six months to a year, and then they wait for our next lockdown major release, and then they lock down on that. Does that make sense to anyone? Does that sound familiar? Okay. So anyways, we would like you to not be on lockdown so you can take advantage of all of our features. 
Um, another important platform concept is, um, does anybody remember the word Spark? Yes, okay. Uh, Spark is Teams, right? Um, and we've merged the backend platform, so we're using the formerly known as Spark Media Engine, we're using the, the formerly known as Spark uh, messaging platform, and we're combining everything on the WebEx meetings platform. And so they can all join and uh, take advantage of the same infrastructure. So you can use a Teams client, you can use a WebEx client, it doesn't matter. Um, there is another key concept uh, that I'll spend a moment on. Um, we call this site linking. So we came up with a new management platform as well with the um, Teams or Spark platform known as the uh, Cisco Control Hub. That's where you manage all your cloud registered devices, where you manage all your users who are doing messaging you know, on Teams. Uh, and it's also where you can now deploy a WebEx site. So one of your questions might be, gee, do I need to move all of my customers? Do I need to, say, migrate? their WebEx sites to Control Hub and manage it there? Um, the answer is no, you don't. Because of a project we have known as site linking, all classic WebEx sites are eligible for site linking, and so nobody needs to migrate or move or change their WebEx site to Control Hub. Okay? Sure, question? Yeah, uh, is there a benefit to moving to Control Hub? Um, I, I think you could say yes. Um, but there's also some drawbacks. So one of the benefits might be um, one admin portal. So if you don't uh, have your WebEx site on Control Hub, you have classic WebEx site admin where you entitle and provision all of the WebEx users and in Control Hub, you, um, you know, would do all of the teams like messaging and cloud registered devices and that sort of thing. So you do have to worry about two admin portals. We cross-launch you, so if you're in Control Hub and you click on WebEx, you'll be redirected to the WebEx admin portal. So it's really only a concern for the site admin. The users won't notice any feature differences. And uh, the truth is, is that um, WebEx site admin has the greatest number and the greatest uh, breadth of features. But it's also true that Control Hub is the environment where we're doing most of our innovation. Like, um, you know, our devices register there, our calendaring and scheduling is going there with uh, the calendar connectors. Uh, we're also doing um, directory connectors, uh, you know, for user identity that I'll talk about later. So there's a lot of development occurring in Control Hub, but because of site linking, I can answer the question, like, do I need my WebEx site on Control Hub? The answer is no. So can I give you a t-shirt, medium or large? Uh, hopefully, I can get rid of all my T-shirts. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you. I didn't want to throw it because I missed last time I tried. <laughs> I spilled somebody's drink. Okay, so uh, this is already talked about. Um, if you haven't seen it before, Control Hub, which shows uh, at a glance status of uh, users, devices, uh, registrations, meetings, and uh, provisioning, and classic side admin. Um, the point is, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, both, both are perfectly good places to, uh, to run your, to your WebEx site. So site linking, um, it's a very simple process. There's a button in site admin. All you have to do is click on it and start the enroll process. Um, you use a site admin's email address. And the other part that you might not see of site admin, if I go to the next slide, uh, when we do site linking, there's also the org creation, you know, because if you have a WebEx site, you might not already have a Teams org, you know, where people are using, say, Teams messaging and maybe Teams calling, et cetera. If they don't already have a Teams like org, uh, site linking will actually create it. If it already exists, a site linking is smart enough to associate that email and that org with each other. So if my email address is also an org admin in the Teams org, as well as on WebEx site admin, Everything works great. So just make sure that if you do the site linking, use the right email address if your org already exists. Question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of the analytics comes from Control Hub. Um, yeah, that's an important point. Uh, so, like, the, um, if you do site linking of your classic WebEx site, you get all the benefits of analytics. 
In fact, it might be the only reason you site link. Like, uh, maybe you don't want to use Teams, or maybe you're not interested in Teams, but you are actually interested in the WebEx analytics. So to take advantage of that, what you want to do is just do site linking. Don't also do user linking. You have the option of just doing one and not the other. Yeah. No, yeah, so the question was, are we going to roll analytics back to the classic WebEx admin? No. Uh, we decided, um, uh, we, we looked at all the various options of migration, transitions. Uh, we decided site linking is, uh, is the way forward. So um, site linking, probably within the next few months, we will automatically do for the customers so they don't have to actually opt into it and manually do it. But right now it's an uh, opt-in process. I, um, I, can I owe you a T-shirt? <laughs> uh, feel free to grab one. Uh, I have some other give giveaways too. Um, analytics, uh, as was already mentioned, is probably the main reason to do it. Um, if you want to know, um, so before we had WebEx Analytics, we, um, in, in including troubleshooting, we actually had nothing that was uh, user or site admin facing where they could go to troubleshoot problems. And I'll, I'll have an ex I have an extensive example of this where, say, I can extract um, a list in a given time period of all the people who were in a WebEx meeting that were having connection problems. Like our, our uh, analytics is flexible enough to fine tune it to get just the information we're looking for. It's very flexible. Um, just a, a review, this is a, a case study of how redundancy and failover works in WebEx, if you haven't seen it. Um, this is an example of the Cisco.com WebEx rollout, and we have offices around the world. Um, but every single WebEx site has a uh, primary cluster, we call it, and a backup cluster. If there's any problem in the primary cluster, we do this thing called failover. Um, and we also, it's also known as global site backup. And then uh, the other thing this chart is showing is that all the various users, uh, when they connect to a WebEx meeting, if we turn on something known as globally distributed meeting, we can take advantage of all the various WebEx data centers around the world, and we send a copy of the meeting as far as and as close to that user as we can get, and they join the meeting on their local, um, we call it a WebEx point of presence, and that reduces latency and improves quality. So. Um, if you look at a meeting, basically it cascades out to the edge and as close as we can get to the users. Okay, okay. Um, this is just another example of that. Um, in this example, say there's a, a meeting in EMEA, such as here, and we have a, a user in, um, say, APJ. Um, where do they actually join the meeting? They join the meeting in the local POP. They don't actually connect all the way back to the US. That would have been the old way to join a meeting, which uh, has, um, higher latencies, of course, because those are usually public internet connections. Okay, there's a, there's a session on this that I called out earlier, uh, but just to review, uh, if you use Equinix as your uh, data peering partner, uh, WebEx peers with Equinix as well, and you can make an actual private connection to WebEx from the enterprise data center. So what this means is we can basically take the network layer and completely throw it out for your on-net users you know, the off-net users will still connect uh, over the public internet to the WebEx meetings, just as before, but say anyone in the enterprise will take the low latency, high speed, direct peer connection, and uh, we can get the ultimate video quality that I'll talk about uh, a little bit later in this preso. So this is no longer EFT, this is available today, and the most likely customers would probably be the larger WebEx customers that already have Equinix, like say, they might be using it for Salesforce or maybe they're peering with AWS for enhanced services. This would just be yet another thing they could add. Any, uh, any questions on this? Okay. Okay. Um, there is also, um, oh, uh, before I move into the direct audio, there's also um, the roles and responsibilities, if you were just curious. Uh, our relationship with Equinix is you actually build a layer three uh, BGP peering with us. So we will exchange and we um, route with you and uh, we do the network engineering with you. So you spill out a basic form where we share things such as what is the IP address of, you know, the, uh, say your public interface in the Equinix cage, you know, what subnets do you want to advertise to us? And we just request that you, um, 
accept all of the WebEx routes that we send over to you. And once we've done that, now we're BGP established and we can actually route all of the traffic that ends up in WebEx subnets to you over this link rather than having you take the public internet. Um, Equinex owns the cage and they own the layer one and layer two and Cisco is responsible for all the layer three routing. So um, it's possible you may encounter two people, you know, if you were supporting this online, like the, the day one and day two. But, okay. Question? Uh, not at this time, um, but one of the things we are, so the question was anyone other than Equinix? So the answer is not yet, uh, but what we are considering is say allowing uh, service providers, and we're talking to several right now about the best way for say that service provider to be the front end to Equinix for a number of customers. Like so if they have a Metro uh, Ethernet or an MPLS network, um, they can do all of the customer connections because some of the customers don't want to actually build a new circuit to Equinix. You know, they just want to use their existing Metro Ethernet. And so that'll be probably in a phase two for us. But we're in phase one right now. Okay. I, I owe you a t-shirt too. <laughs> or anything else you can grab. Okay. Um, just some, some traffic recommendations. Um, are you anyone familiar with the concept of cold potato, hot potato? It's kind of like a basic routing thing. It means um, what you want to do is get to the backbone um, as fast as possible, um, aka hot potato. And then um, cold potato, you want to stay on the backbone as long as possible. So this can actually be engineered just by using BGP, um, either like preference or community metrics uh, with us uh, that, so that the traffic uh, goes where you want. One of the questions you might have when you're deploying say direct peered connections is, I have multi-site, multi-region, how do I make sure all the traffic gets to where it's going and doesn't say take odd paths around the world? Um, the answer is don't worry, uh, BGP is very good at this. You just have to configure it right. And, and our NOC can, can work with you on that. Okay, um, there is an entire session on WebEx uh, Edge audio that's occurring, um, I put in the uh, part of this, uh, uh, the earlier slide in this deck. Um, but basically WebEx Edge Audio is um, a, a pretty neat project that we have. Uh, one of the hard requirements is an expressway for now. If a customer has an expressway, what they can do is basically zero out uh, the WebEx on net audio calls. So what we actually do in the configuration is um, from WebEx admin, um, a customer will pick a given country code or a list of country codes and they will direct all of the WebEx traffic to a given expressway or expressway cluster that they have. And they can also make sets of uh, many sets of expressways, say like you may have a number in North America, a number in uh, EMEA, and a number in APJ. And you can assign all the various country codes to those um, direct audio connections. And you can also fall back on WebEx PSTN for those countries that you don't select for WebEx audio. So what that means is uh, working with uh, WebEx PSTN, the standard WebEx global footprint of you know, PSTN, you can also supplement that, such as uh, if you have an office in the UK, you can direct the UK 44 area code down to uh, your London uh, expressway cluster. And so all call-ins and call-backs from uh, that London location will be directly connected and completely avoid uh, any toll charges. So, question? Yeah, yeah, the recommendation is um, you do have to worry about uh, the expressway load. So they don't have to be dedicated, uh, but they could. Because um, you just have to look at what the WebEx audio traffic is and if the, your expressways have capacity. We don't have any strict requirements about isolating expressways for this. But uh, just be aware of the call um, capacity of given expressways. And we probably recommend deploying them in a redundant cluster. Because if something's down, you know, your WebEx callbacks and call-ins will be down. Uh, an admin in a fail scenario, the most common thing that they may have to do is go into WebEx site admin, uncheck that country code, and make sure that we fall back to WebEx PSTN, then figure out whatever the expressway is doing and bring it back. Good question. I owe you a t-shirt as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, so there's a whole session on this, but I just wanted to mention it. Um, there's also the video mesh node. Um, this has been around for a while, uh, probably known as the hybrid media node to you folks as well. 
Um, what it basically does is it consolidates media on-prem, lowers latency, uh, improves the video quality, and that sort of thing. And um, the main benefit there is basically reduced uh, bandwidth and increased uh, video quality. So um, one thing that's relatively new is SIP endpoints, right, the on-prem registered devices, now also use the video mesh node. When we first released it, it was just for the Teams clients and the cloud registered endpoints. And in the second half of this year, um, so we expect that not only will the on-prem devices and the cloud registered devices and the Teams clients, will also get the WebEx clients using the video mesh node. So uh, stay tuned for that. Question? Nope. Yeah. Yeah, the question was, does the video mesh node use the expressways? It bypasses uh, that completely. Uh, these uh, negotiate and talk with the firewall uh, directly. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, th this is a uh, TLS connection uh, to the cloud. So uh, it it's covered in that other session extensively. But uh, basically, um, we do leverage uh, the public cloud you know, AWS for the signaling traffic. And if it's a WebEx meeting, the, web, the, the media goes directly from the video mesh node to our cloud. And uh, if you were direct peering with us, like via Equinix, that would actually be a completely private circuit. Like it would never go over the public. Okay, uh, good question. T-shirt for you too, please. please. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, there's also, uh, we just discussed this a second ago, but uh, a reference uh, chart just for what a typical deployment looks like, I think it would be important. Uh, based on that last question, uh, you do actually see the video mesh node, uh, the two arrows I drew, you know, carefully avoided the expressway pair. Uh, we interact directly with the firewall. So um, you know, uh, stay tuned for its proxy support and uh, typical firewall interactions. Uh, I'm not covering it in this section, sure. Oh yeah, can you can you host a uh, video mesh node in AWS? Um, so uh, we don't officially support that, uh, but I mean we're, we are definitely talking about uh, being able to support it, like um, in our HCS, you know, cloud uh, deployments. But that's okay because we're using UCS chassis there. Um, we don't currently have like an AWS uh, image for video mesh node. Okay. Uh, good question. Uh, but uh, the rest of this chart, as I'm just saying, um, you know, WebEx audio on the right uh, is a separate uh, media stream. Uh, those are all configured and controlled uh, separately. The uh, WebEx clients very often go directly over the internet um, on-prem. We use expressways for the video devices. If you have cloud-registered um, video devices, those signal directly with the public cloud, and the media will uh, terminate in the WebEx data center. So just a reminder on what we used to call CMR Cloud, which is uh, you know, now just WebEx Video, because every WebEx meeting um, is CMR enabled, so we just call it WebEx Video now. Just a reminder, um, your expressways are basically anchoring the media, and they do uh, re-encrypt the media if the customer is not uh, doing encrypted media on-prem. But we don't have any hard requirements on encrypting the media or the signaling. We make it flexible, so depending on the policy that your customer has is what they'll get. Uh, so uh, if you haven't read our uh, WebEx video deployment guide, uh, feel free to grab it. It's, on a, it's one of our more popular collaboration help articles. But this is all um, relatively old. Uh, are your customers using uh, WebEx video, aka CMR? Is it pretty common? Video dialing? Yes? A few, okay. Okay, um, this is just a, one of my last um, platform uh, slides. We have a concept called minimally trans, uh, transcoded conferencing. So to put that into English, what we mean is um, we do video switching wherever it's possible because it's faster um, and uh, higher performance and leads to better quality and we transcode where necessary. So if you look at the type of video devices we have, if you're using Teams, um, if you're using a WebEx board, if you're using a cloud-registered device, these are all doing multi-stream, aka 
switching video, and the classic devices such as anything that's SIP or 323, our Jabber clients as well. Um, if you have a hybrid, um, excuse me, a video mesh node, or you're just going direct to the cloud and you're using our cloud uh, media engine, um, they're all following the same, same basic procedure. So um, I have a slide that discusses um, multi-stream and SVC in a second. Um, this is a, uh, an enhancement that we've had as well. If you have one of our dual screen videos, um, our video platform too has been enhanced recently. So uh, if you haven't seen um, how it behaved in video platform 1.0, we had the unfortunate consequence of this second monitor not lighting up um, if content wasn't being shared. So now what we can do, the default view, if you connect, is this one will be, say, a two by two or some other layout that you can actually select uh, you know, using the keys. Um, if you're sharing content, you also have greater flexibility on what the layouts are going to be. So we've greatly improved the experience on the dual screen. And um, so only Cisco is doing that in um, cloud conferencing today, where we have uh, a dual screen endpoint that takes you know, like a main video one and also a main video two. And uh, on top of that, we can also share, share the content channel. And so we still will do the uh, picture in picture across the bottom, say, if there's additional participants. And it's very flexible. Um, Video Platform 2 has also made an enhancement regarding avatars or the uh, little picture in picture windows. So if this is the um, device, uh, has anybody seen this, this kind of behavior before? So it happens in, in one basic way, even on Video Platform 2, right? Like, say the user doesn't turn their camera on. So we don't have a solution for that. But uh, if, the video, if the camera is turned on, this is what you're going to get. So before, we used to only have um, all participants, say, on the WebEx side. All you would get is one active speaker shown to the telepresence side. And the telepresence side would only see one active speaker from the WebEx side. Now we're sharing um, up to five each way. And later on in the year, we're going to up that to maybe 20. So what the benefit there is, is it looks like it's just one conference. So uh, with all of our default layouts, we have enough um, thumbnails now that uh, the users won't be able to tell that anything is weird. So this is just another way of looking at that. Um, and I apologize for the text, but uh, I think if you grab the deck and you want to take a, take a read, um, what we're doing in uh, multi-stream, uh, you could call it, it's actually H.264 simulcast. And what that means is, is if I have a call into the cloud or if I'm calling from point to point, when I'm using H.264 simulcast, which is a version of SVC, I have um, a base layer and I have a um, more, um, say, additional resolution layer, like I might send the 360p layer, then I send a additional layer that is 720p, and I may even send um, the 1080p layer. And I could send one layer that is, if I'm only 15 frames per second, uh, we call that temporal, and one for 30 frames per second. And depending on the abilities of the receivers or the listeners, they will select from one of these channels. Uh, that's what multi-stream is doing. So, in order to build those thumbnails that you saw earlier, we use multi-stream, which is I send um, my base layer, and I also send the thumbnail layer. So each endpoint is actually sending multi-streams at all given times, which is why we call it multi-stream. Um, and this is just a uh, eye chart, just for your reference. These are all the things that Video Platform 2 is working on. So um, our video platform is not static. Um, you know, go ahead and grab the deck. And everything here is either available or coming this month. Um, for instance, 200 uh, video participants is huge. We've got the roster list. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but the WebEx roster list, right, where you see all the participants, has been usually only shared on the WebEx side. If you call in from video, you don't see all the participants. You just see, like, WebEx and then all the other telepresence systems because you're calling into a bridge. Uh, with uh, this month, you'll get one complete roster list finally. So we're, we're pretty happy about that. Okay, um, this might be the focus of the presentation, so I wanted to do it justice, uh, just describing some of the things you need to worry about. 
when you're doing um, mass deployments of um, WebEx. And what that means really is I'm trying to roll out 100 users, I'm trying to roll out 500, and you know, um, if I'm you know, really uh, feeling up to it, maybe 10,000 users of, of WebEx all at once. Um, so there's a couple things to be aware of, and I'll just describe the basic project and, and how it works, okay? So um, has anyone heard of the, the WebEx desktop app? It's basically the successor to productivity tools. Um, anybody seen that yet? Yeah, okay. Yes, we, we pushed it down to you, so if you weren't on lockdown, uh, you have this. If you have a customer with lockdown, this would be new to them, because they're still on 32. So anyways, what is the desktop app? Before, we had um, a pre-meeting app called Productivity Tools and the in-meeting app called the WebEx Desktop Client. Now, this, uh, the desktop app is actually both combined. So you have both the pre-meeting and you have the post-meeting um, client. So um, some of the other things that the desktop app can do, which I'll talk about later, is local sharing, uh, which is really great. So one of the... Um, one of the things that users like to do is run into a room and just take advantage of sharing uh, whatever they have on the, um, on the uh, cloud registered um, you know, telepresence device that we sell. So the, the, um, the desktop app can do that. You can also do it from the Teams app. They both work. Um, and in addition to that, if you're connecting to a meeting, you can also do the um, uh, local sharing and um, you can do the, I'm sorry, you can do the device control. So if I'm joining the meeting from my mobile or from my desktop, I can actually use the desktop app, pair with the room that I'm sitting in, and join it from there. Uh, if you wanted to see a demo of that, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's a really great feature. I think it's, a, it's the best way to bring our devices together, because I think the first time we tried to improve the meeting join experience, we called it one button to push, because users basically don't want to go to a device and type in the meeting address or the URI or uh, dial you know, a bunch of conference pins and hit pound and it's confusing and terrible. Um, so one button to push requires scheduling and it's great. But now if the meeting isn't scheduled and I just have a calendar invite on my phone, I walk into a room and if I'm running the desktop app, I just um, you know, pair with the unit, just takes a couple of seconds, uses ultrasound, I just need to be within 30 feet or so of the of the, of the device, and then I can transfer the meeting from my device to the, to the room. It's great. And uh, even when you're in a meeting, if I haven't transferred the call, I can even take whatever that device is seeing as the share, and I can see that as well. So you get the local pair and share, and it's just a great experience for the users in a room. So anyways, um, to describe um, the desktop app, um, one of the things that a lot of people are worried about in deployments, or whether, and this is one of the reasons I mentioned that we have lockdown versus non-lockdown, is admin rights. Um, some, some users, that's actually really common, don't have local admin rights. And so um, when we push a app to them and they need to install it, they can't because the app requires admin rights. Uh, well, one of the nice things about the desktop app is it doesn't. So um, fortunately, that'll be a workaround for you. Um, also, the updates, there's a checkbox I'm showing you. That's, uh, this is in site admin. Um, when desktop app updates are available, you as a site admin can control whether or not those get pushed out. So you don't necessarily have to have your users do it. You can still script the desktop app updates. Um, but there is uh, another behavior that the desktop app will do regarding updates. Every time it joins a meeting, it's going to do a check to see if its a desktop app version matches the version on the site. And if it doesn't, if it's a prior release, it will upgrade itself automatically. And there's nothing you need to do, and there are no admin rights required. So the, the maintenance of the desktop app that I'm trying to say is um, really quite automatic. All you need to do is trust that it doesn't require admin rights, turn on that checkbox to allow updates, and you'll have no worries about your desktop app maintenance. Really, all you want to do is the first step of the desktop app rollout, which you'll still want to bundle and deliver. And uh, I have a slide on that in, a, in just a minute. And it's available, of course, both on Windows and, and PC. Okay. Um, and there's another client that I think is actually really important, and this is something probably for, it's most important for guest users, I believe. 
So what is one of the biggest complaints about the WebEx desktop client? Anybody? There might be many complaints, but I think one of the biggest ones, at least for a new user, is, um, oh my goodness, uh, it takes forever to load and download and install, and um, it's got some plugins, and I don't know, it keeps popping up and asking for uh, permission to do things. Um, can you please stop? So um, I don't think we're quite ready to say that this, uh, our browser client, the web app, is ready to completely replace it but we're really close, and I think we're absolutely there for guest access. So like say if your customer's company is having a WebEx meeting and they want to have a third party join it and they, maybe they don't have a WebEx client, they're going to get prompted to just use the web app to join it by default. We have site admin controls to control this behavior on whether or not you make sure that the desktop app is more important than the web app and it, what logic it uses. Like, do I check to see if the desktop app is loaded, and if so, use it, or do I just use the web app, or I, do I just use the desktop app regardless? So um, one of the most, uh, the biggest holes that we had for the web app where uh, do my camera, uh, uh, does my camera work, and can I be a host, and can I share? Um, all of these we have today for both Meeting Center and Event Center. So if you want to use either of our most popular WebEx centers, uh, the web app is perfectly fine for it. So um, just, to, just to be aware, I think the web app, if you look in our site admin controls, is more and more important than uh, maybe it's ever been. And I think it's actually possible to make this your default client, and uh, it should reduce any of the um, complaints regarding load time and challenges getting going. Um, but we still, you know, just FYI, um, we still use WebRTC, which has some uh, specific browser limitations, so you want to guide people towards Chrome and Firefox if you want their cameras to work. You can use other browsers, but those other browsers don't support the camera. Okay, um, this is just an overview of uh, mass deployment. Uh, follow your standard software distribution strategies, you know, whether you do it in certain uh, patches of users, all users at once, uh, on a rolling basis. Um, grab our desktop app, which we make available on your site. Just go to downloads on your own site. You wanna use your own site because it's possible if you try to grab a different version or you had one um, from, say, months ago, it might not be the current version. Uh, we always keep the latest and most accurate version of the desktop app on the site itself. So just go to your site, go to downloads, and grab the current one, and deploy it however you normally do. Um, lockdown customers, of course, don't need to worry about the client updates because the client, once delivered, is gonna be static until you um, unlock down again. So nothing to do for a lockdown. Okay, so um, this, uh, hopefully I still have your attention. Um, this is basically a, um, this slide and the next one are basically what we look at, and I apologize if it's hard to see, I'll, I'll, I'll talk through it and maybe this is worth more when you see it. <coughs> basically, deploying a WebEx customer um, has a, so uh, before I put this slide together, um, I, I talked with some of my uh, colleagues and um, they, they were challenging me, challenging me when I said, you know, um, deploying WebEx, we actually have to have a plan for. Uh, we actually have to worry about a couple of specific tasks. We have to make a timeline and we have to measure our success. So I get a lot of pushback on this. Uh, my, um, uh, the people that manage the product and the engineering staff say, this is just a cloud service. Uh, all the work is for the site admin and the users just have to be there and accept the software and train themselves how to use it. There's, there is no deployment, Joe. Um, but uh, based on my conversations with our large enterprise customers, that couldn't be further from the truth. So if you're doing a deployment, you have to worry about the technical challenges. You have to deploy, say, the devices. They have to be registered. They have to be available. Um, maybe you need to do some work with your on-premises devices and your dial plan. And you can make uh, tasks for all the, say, video devices. And that's just one part of the project. Then the next part of the project might be user identity. Where is identity stored? Is it in Active Directory? And I have a whole section on this, so sorry to bring it up now before I explain it, but you know, where do the user accounts get created? 
how do we provision the users? How do we make sure that they have a host license? That's a, a topic as well. And then the security team. How do we get make sure that this uh, application works in the enterprise? So does anyone have um, any problems sometimes getting approval for software with your customers' InfoSec teams? Or do they always say, hey, everything's great, this is fine, just go ahead, right? No, of course not. Um, you have to get permission, you have to explain exactly what the flows are, you have to satisfy their, say, privacy concerns, and you have to get them to trust, probably, in the actual vendor and their solution. So this is not trivial. Um, so basically, what you can do is create a project goal, and that's just all the technical factors that I've mentioned. The most crucial factor, I think, is the human factor. So humans are where uh, the project is successful or fails every single time. And so we now have the tools to actually help you with that step. Um, so the issue is, is we start with, say, the key stakeholders. We start with maybe a proof of concept, and we start with a pilot. So we have a limited scale rollout, and we figure out what these users are doing and how they're adopting, um, say, WebEx meetings, what they're doing with audio, and we can actually measure, because of Control Hub and analytics, um, how many meetings are created, what the trend is, are people actually using the service, is adoption growing or is it not? Uh, so we know at a glance if there's any problems. Uh, we know because you're supposed to get some kind of an adoption curve uh, in the users as you roll it out. And once we finally go to a mass deployment, if we understand those issues, uh, we can loop back into the process what went wrong. You know, so if you do a quick survey of your pilot users and you ask them, um, okay, what was preventing adoption? What is the problem? And you can discover, uh, like, oh, I don't know, uh, something was wrong with uh, cameras, something was wrong with uh, training. Uh, maybe they don't know how to schedule meetings. Maybe they don't know how to use the conference rooms. And we feed that back into the process. So um, I think the, the point of this slide and the next one is identify uh, the key deployment steps on the technical side, um, identify the human factors, train the users, get their feedback, feed that back into the system, and also um, uh, use, uh, use the available analytics to measure your success and to make changes. And so a typical deployment might probably take three to six months, and we go through a couple of loops. Um, this isn't just make the software available, hope for the best, and then go away. Because um, you know, this is something that can, um, uh, what do you say, it doesn't fix itself. You, you have to watch it. And so you do have the tools now to, me to measure and monitor the success and to work with the uh, users and to train them, okay? Um, so that was um, you know, big, just some generic project goals. So it's really just borrowing from um, what uh, any, any IT software delivery project is. Uh, everyone follows the same basic procedures and WebEx is no different. Okay, so users and identity management. Um, this is actually a really important topic as well, right? It's the, it's the first step when you go to deploy. So the question is, where do users come from? You know, like uh, when you have a classic WebEx site admin site, which is 90 something percent of all of the WebEx sites, um, they have, uh, you know, the question is, where do these accounts come from? There's only four methods. One, I can go into site admin. I, go to users and click add. I can make a user, fill in their email address and some, whatever the other details are and hit enter. That's one way to do it. Very painful. Do, does anyone want to do that 10,000 times? No, I don't, I don't either. Uh, CSV import, um, also painful. So what I could do is go to AD, export my users, have everything in the right template, upload it to WebEx, and it creates all the accounts. Um, that's kind of a pain in the neck too because you're gonna be, um, formatting fields in Excel um, probably rather extensively to make that work right, and it's kind of a pain in the neck. Um, the easiest, I think, is the SAML, we call it SAML just-in-time account provisioning. Uh, that was a key development we had in Site Admin. What that means is uh, I just do two things. I go to WebEx Site Admin and check auto account create, you know, with, with, with SAML just-in-time provisioning as a checkbox. And then I go to my identity provider and configure single sign-on for the WebEx site. And as soon as we get a successful authentication, right, like I've used, um, say if you're integrating with single sign-on, it ties back to your AD, and if that user exists, all we do is we go, great, um, 
okay, I have a valid authentication request. Does this user have an account? No. If the account doesn't already exist, we create it. Uh, so that's the key way to create a WebEx account. And I apologize if everyone doesn't know that. Uh, I think we should make this point clearer that that's really where uh, users come from. And the final one is the new way. So we have a product called Directory Connector. Uh, Directory Connector is uh, just our newest way of integrating with the on-prem, um, or we also work with um, uh, Azure, uh, you know, the, the Microsoft Cloud Active Directory. Uh, either way, um, Cisco Directory Connector will you know, access the customer's uh, directory information, and it does exactly the same thing. So it just goes, um, finds your users, and you can put an Active Directory filter or like a container filter, and it'll add those users that you pick. Okay, any, any questions on, oh sorry, how was it, yeah. Yeah, that's something that we can do as well. Yeah, so the question was, um, so I get the account created, but I don't get the CMR, aka WebEx video entitlement automatically. Yeah, we can make that, that is a, um, uh, a site admin setting as well. Um, we have an article on that on Collab Help. Uh, what you can do is uh, you're gonna have to, um, uh, are you familiar with the concept of a WebEx CSM, like customer service manager? Um, you contact your WebEx CSM, get them to open up a ticket, and you just have to ask them to turn on automatic CMR enablement for new accounts, and they can do it for you. So um, that's, a, that's a good call out. The only other way to fix that would have been use SAML just in time auto account create, export your user list, go to the CMR flag, turn it on, and then import it back. <laughs> that would do it too. Or you could do it one at a time also, the painful way. It's a good question. I think I, I gave you a t-shirt yesterday. <laughs> oh, so uh, I got a bunch of questions. Shoot, okay. I'll try to just take a couple, but go ahead. Just regarding your cost per activation, I mean, you pointed to this. You have a lot of cost per activation of Azure Cloud compared to the old version. So why do I need to reactivate options when I have a transfer from the old WebEx environment Oh, like you're talking about Teams? Yeah. Yeah, you're talking about Teams uh, user activation? A WebEx test sites? Okay. Yeah, uh, can I talk to you about that after? Okay. Okay. Uh, one other question? Yeah. Uh, deprovisioning, right, the question. Yeah, yeah, uh, I have a slide on that. Um, I have a, a great flow on deprovisioning. Good question. <laughs> yeah, it does that too. I think it's coming in just one or two. Um, you guys probably all know what a WebEx host is, but I think you know, it's just worth defining what the current WebEx licensing is. Uh, we have named user, active host, employee count, um, and we also have enterprise license agreements. So named user is, I don't know, you'll pick, say, 100 WebEx licenses and you just hand them out to 100 individuals and you'll have to maintain those 100 users. If one person's not using it, you kind of take their license and assign it to somebody else. It's kind of a pain in the neck. Uh, active host is sort of like similar. It's a bit more expensive because what we'll say is, oh, you can have up to 100 WebEx uh, hosts at a time. When that 101st tries to create a meeting, um, it'll tell them, sorry, you're out of licenses. So that's also kind of a pain in the neck because you have to manage that. Um, employee count, those are some of our enterprise agreements where pretty much everybody gets a license. And so we'll license your entire company at some 10 or 15% ratio of you know, knowledge workers to employees, and that usually is satisfactory. Okay. Okay, um, and we already discussed this. Uh, where do your users get managed? After users got created, uh, you know, site admin or control hub, just depends on where your site is managed. Okay, uh, I built a, a graph for the preferred user identity model. If you have a classic WebEx site and you're using SSO, this is just the identity flow, right? We do the SAML uh, check with your identity provider. The identity provider uh, refers back to your on-prem AD and uh, eventually it will get authenticated equals true or false and off we go. 
site and user linking, as I mentioned, um, what it does is it creates a, a one-way link between the classic WebEx environment and puts users into teams if they already exist in WebEx. So what it basically does is it populates teams with a list of all your WebEx users so that your WebEx users can quickly and easily roll out teams. Uh, your, one of your questions might be, hey, I have directory connector. What if I have some kind of a state uh, race condition where maybe I deleted the user in WebEx, directory connector tried to put them back, what happens? Uh, the truth is, is that's not a scenario that we're guarded against. So what we recommend, if you do single sign-on on one side, on classic WebEx site admin, please ensure that you also do it on Teams so that that scenario doesn't happen. Because otherwise, directory connector will happily go, hmm, that user's just been deleted. Well, I see him in AD, let's put him back. But if single sign-on is available on both sides, there's only one source of truth, it's your AD. Okay? And then, so that's just whether or not the user has a, an account. Uh, you can control the licensing independently, right? Provisioning, which is probably what you're trying to do anyways. Okay, so this is just a graph of user provisioning in WebEx, right? So um, you create uh, the user account in Active Directory, and um, you know, based on um, the directory connector sync, um, the account gets created in Teams, right? And so that was the, the team side. And on the uh, Cisco WebEx meeting side, um, we're using the SAML just-in-time you know, account create. And then um, if your user exists in WebEx and not in Teams, you can only log in on one side versus the other unless you've done the user linking that I've talked about. So once you've done user linking, that user account that exists in WebEx will now also exist in Teams. So that's one other reason to do the Teams uh, linking. Okay? And I think the question was about deprovisioning. Um, I made a, a graph on deprovisioning and how does uh, deprovisioning work. So in the user linking scenario, the Cisco WebEx side is the master for the account. So if we did site and user linking and I created an account on the WebEx meeting side uh, and a delete occurs, like say an admin went into Cisco WebEx and deleted the user, or if I'm AD tied and the account was deleted in Active Directory, um, what Teams does is it receives that sync notification from our cloud and actually goes ahead and deprovisions the user. Um, we don't move it into deleted state for 30 days. Um, that's just a, a standard uh, cleanup policy we have on the Teams environment. Does that answer your question on deprovisioning? Okay. Great. Okay. Um, this is more of a forward-looking statement on uh, things that we're, that we're doing with user identity. We're at phase one, which um, we have one license template. Um, this is regarding, like, say, host enablement or host entitlement, you know, whether or not I give them a license. So we have one template. So not just user account creation, but also host entitlement and provisioning. Um, we have a single template that um, will give that user, say, a WebEx meeting host license, say, a WebEx Teams license for messaging, and maybe even mess uh, WebEx calling. Um, what we're gonna move to is uh, described here to be a bit more granular, so we could have multiple templates, say, this group gets calling, this group gets meetings, this group gets nothing, so uh, everyone gets an account, but their provisioning, uh, their automatic provisioning will be more flexible. So today, basically, what we do is you get an account and you'll get a default entitlement, such as messaging in WebEx, and you can make that default, whatever you want. Um, if you've seen it, um, just go to our Clab Help uh, site and look at auto license assignment. Uh, this is just an example of a user, say, by default, being given messaging, meeting, and hybrid services access. Uh, you can make that uh, as much or as little as you want. You know, like here's where you would control whether or not they get a WebEx meetings license by default. You can always go back in and change it. That's just when the account gets created. Okay. So I think my, my text flew off the page a little bit, uh, but SSO should be um, old hat. This is just basically the classic ladder diagram of how single sign-on works. Uh, we highly, highly recommend it in the enterprise. 
um, because your identity provider can match with uh, all of a customer's basic um, policies regarding authentication, two-factor, uh, anything they need to do. Um, WebEx authentication is not quite as, as flexible. Uh, if you haven't taken a look, go to our collaboration help portal and you'll see a number of articles and a single sign-on guides on how to do it. Um, and then um, just uh, in, in early field trials that you should be aware of is this simple cross-domain identity management concept, which is really basically entitlement and provisioning, right? Handing off the licenses, the capabilities all in one step. Um, so look forward to this that was also kind of described in phase two. And so these are all the various identity providers that we're working with, and there will be a lot more uh, that will be able to do that for you. So you'll be able to be a lot more flexible to not just just-in-time provision a user account, but also to just-in-time provision their user licenses based on whatever criteria you have. So this will be great. This will enable us to deploy customers um, automatically and as flexibly as you need. So this was the um, SSO uh, guidelines. Okay, um, and then I have a great example. Sure, question? What's the timeline for phase two? Phase two will be this year. Yeah, so uh, we're thinking like in August-ish, we should have skim. So that means if you're rolling out a customer this summer, it might, be a, might not be there yet. <laughs> you might have to use a default uh, provisioning template and then manually adjust them. Okay, um, uh, analytics. Uh, I, I promised that I wanted to give you an example, but um, this is something we've never had before, and like um, I, I should have maybe introduced myself, but I came from TAC at Cisco, and I spent about a decade there, and so that was a very, very long period of my life, but what it gave me is a very, very strong sensitivity to customers that have problems. So I'm always on the lookout for uh, ways that make um, you know, it easier for our customers' lives. Well, this is something that makes an admin's life easier. Like, um, Pretty much every day of my life, this is what it sounds like. Hey, uh, Joe, um, one of our customers was in a meeting and uh, they were saying something was wrong. Uh, can you look into it? Yeah, I can look into it because I have access to the, all of the backend reporting data, but the site admin, right, the guy from IT that's complaining to me, he never had anything. So um, this is a very, very bold statement, but I can say it confidently. Um, if you are a site admin, and you have a control hub with analytics, which just requires site linking, you know, and it's available to everyone, just do it. Um, if you have that, you can go into your meetings and create, uh, we call it like a trouble list. Any user that's ever been having a problem at some predefined threshold, such as uh, jitter beyond a certain spec, latency beyond our spec, uh, packet loss beyond our spec, you know, like 2%, um, I can make that entire list through any duration of time I want. That's pretty amazing. And so I just wanted to show you what that looks like. And this is exactly how you would create that report. It's like five clicks and you'll get all that data. So log into Control Hub and um, go to the Meetings tab, right? So if you want the WebEx Meetings information, that's all you gotta do, right? There's a whole bunch of other stuff in Control Hub like device reports, video mesh node reports, what users are doing, you know, ignore that just for this step. I wanna know what the WebEx meetings problems are. So step two, if you look at time, um, I know you can't read these, but these are months. We just kind of default view by giving you the month data. You can change that to daily, uh, uh, I think weekly uh, or and quarterly, but uh, just select the month, that's the default view and it makes it as easy as possible. In this example, I'm just picking August 2018 when I made this chart. So I want to know who all the problematic users are in August. So the first thing I do is click on August. And then you can see uh, right here, I have my first sort criteria. I'm just looking at the August meetings, which is this bar right here, okay? And so now I've selected that month. And now, um, if you notice, there is a chart right here. So it shows um, all the meetings in the month and I get this is the list of all the users that don't have problems based on the predefined uh, threshold. And this little bar that's red is actually the list of all the users that we want. So all you gotta do is hit the mouse, click that red area, and keep going. So now I've I have all these sort criteria you know, by month, 
um, by uh, location anywhere and by uh, above my predefined thresholds. And so now I have the entire list. I'm actually done. And if you look at this list down here, it starts listing them all sequentially and it shows you like, you know, here's their VoIP packet loss, you know, here's whether they were TCP or UDP connected and if they had join meeting time problems, that it shows literally everything. All I've got to do is hit this button right here and go export CSV. And here's my, you know, uh, problematic user list. And so if you sort it by user, you'll get duplicates, right? And you'll see uh, duplicates is pe are people that are having uh, multiple problems. So what I can do now is say, okay, I get random problem reports and um, I don't know how many problems there are in my company, um, but now I don't even have to worry about who's reporting problems to me. I can just run a report and find who is actually having problems and then I can try to take some steps to say alleviate their pain. So isn't that, that's pretty amazing, right? Sure, question? Uh, sorry, I didn't, didn't hear that. Oh yeah, so the predefined limits right now are fixed. So we've decided on our platform based on, you know, like uh, years and years of data that we know that latency beyond 250 milliseconds is noticeable. Packet loss beyond 2% can be noticeable if they're TCP connected, if they're UDP connected, it won't be, but we include 2% packet loss just because they tend to have other problems too. And then jitter, we have a predefined figure of, you know, 30 milliseconds. If you're true in any of those, you make the list. And uh, we're gonna have the ability for you to set those limits yourself so you can make them you know, less sensitive or more sensitive, but uh, we can confidently say anybody in this list is probably having problems. Sure, question? Yeah, 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 the, yeah, the, was, was the question the cloud registered devices, the Teams clients, the Teams devices? Yeah, that stuff is all coming. Um, the cloud registered devices will be available um, in March, um, and then the SIP registered devices on-prem. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging for us. Uh, that'll probably be available in the June timeframe, and the Teams clients themselves are also coming in March. So today it's just the WebEx clients, you may have noticed, but uh, this is a developing platform. platform. We're getting more and more data sources into it. It's gonna have a more and more complete list. So yeah, great question. I owe you a t-shirt too. I didn't necessarily want to talk about, um, you know, the roadmap, but there, there, so be it. I, <laughs> I did. Sure. Question. Is there a possibility to get those into the API as well? Yeah. So that's coming too. So the question, if you didn't hear it, was, you know, can we just have this pushed out to us, or grab it via API? Um, we don't have it today, but it's it's definitely coming. Yeah, because that way you could like say plug it into Splunk or something and have a, your own dashboard, and uh, you know, do whatever you want with it. Yeah, that too. And then maybe just a, just a word on our data platform. It's uh, semi-real-time, um, so you can look at quote-unquote live meeting stats, but they'll be about 10 minutes delayed. So, you know, if there's a meeting that you want to monitor that's actually ongoing, you can do that too in this platform. Something also that we've never had before. Okay, um, and how am I doing on time? I guess I'm doing okay. Um, firewall is uh, also a popular uh, topic. Um, so, um, gosh, uh, firewalls are basically the bane of our existence, I think is safe to say. Um, would anybody agree? <laughs> you know, like working with customer firewalls is kind of a, a pain, so I made it, it it's, a, its own section. Um, what can I say about firewalls? So, uh, is anybody familiar with WebEx port um, UDP 9000? Does that ring a bell to anyone if you've worked with our firewalls? No, um, UDP 9000 is the port that WebEx uses for um, media, and that's our preferred port. And our performance on um, quality on media is uh, in greatly enhanced if we get UDP port 9000. And the reason I lead a, a firewall discussion is that's really the first thing that we kind of ask for, is can we please get, um, uh, can we please get UDP 9000 uh, open, right? Um, uh, without UDP 9000, we're forced to do TCP connections for media, and uh, I have a chart a little bit later, but uh, our performance is just much worse. So usually the, the firewall discussions begin and end with uh, UDP 9000, and that's just from the WebEx client. 
Um, there's also the video endpoint traffic, you know, CMR, telepresence, and maybe cloud register devices and video mesh nodes as well. They're all gonna have their individual um, media connections and port connections with a firewall, and they all have to be permitted, and we have extensive documentation on each, uh, and I'll just cover some of the summary of that in this section, okay? So, um, but suffice to say that we, uh, we live and die by firewall configuration. You know, the, uh, if, they, if a firewall is inspecting our traffic, it's gonna imp uh, affect video quality. One of the more common scenarios I get would be, say, um, a third-party firewall or maybe even a Cisco firewall like an ASA is performing traffic inspection. And so what does traffic inspection do? It basically does a store and forward and it tries to look at some kind of a, uh, a threat uh, profile and tries to categorize the traffic and that processing delay on each and every media packet uh, in, uh, impacts video quality, uh, often because that's a CPU driven function and so the, um, the firewalls can only handle so much of this inspection capability and as that buffer fills, we're gonna add latency to the traffic, right? And so all of that doesn't look good. Sure, question? Um, IPS or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Like uh, I think yeah, IPS or uh, WAP, uh, like application layer gateways, same idea, right? Like uh, if you have like a, um, they have the exact same problems. Yeah. Uh, was there another question or? Uh, I'm okay, okay. So, um, uh, moving on from this, the basic firewall is just to you know, talk about um, what the WebEx Edge is doing or what the WebEx Edge is looking for. Um, you might have noticed uh, both WebEx and both our Edge only support TLS 1.2, which was you know, a hard requirement from last year. Uh, there were a lot of uh, threatening statements made from various regulation uh, arms about if you still use TLS 1.0 or 1.1, don't worry. Um, uh, this, this still says PARC, but Teams and WebEx do have some slightly different uh, certificate uh, trust sets. Uh, just refer to our documentation on it, just so you know that we don't actually share all the same trusted root cert. So if you load in a, a cert in our expressway to trust WebEx traffic, uh, just know that Teams uh, will require one for the Teams side as well. Uh, they're independent. They use a different uh, trusted root. Um, we do support mutual authentication, um, and then maybe an interesting concept if you, if you weren't aware, uh, in our cloud, we have something known as L2SIP. So if you have a cloud registered device and you do a SIP call, um, what it's gonna do is it signals and send its meeting, uh, media to the public cloud, and in the public cloud, we have that L2SIP gateway, which translates the WebEx um, cloud registered endpoint into a standard-based SIP call. And so anytime a cloud registered device calls into WebEx, it actually goes through our L2 SIP gateway in the cloud, of course. Okay, um, this is just maybe an FYI. Um, on the top, I have the Teams clients, and on the bottom is WebEx. Uh, there's just one call out. If you're doing QoS and network design on the WebEx client, one problem we have is um, we don't use a hard range for audio and video like the Teams client does. It all comes from one pool. So just be aware if you're trying to strictly identify traffic on the network, uh, you're gonna have to rely on something else to identify audio and video separately in the WebEx client. So good to know is our um, Windows client will um, not be able to uh, tag the traffic by itself, but the Mac does but there's other Cisco technologies based on application recognition, recognition such as NBAR, NBAR2, and DNA-C, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, when they're running in your network, uh, they can identify WebEx traffic and they will uh, assign the appropriate you know, uh, DSCP or QoS values. Um, but Teams does that by itself. It's one of the enhancements that the Teams platform has given to us is whenever they're using traffic, uh, they use clearly defined ranges and they tag the traffic by themselves. Um, the WebEx client um, does require on some network intelligence, unless you're on a Mac, for it to tag its traffic, okay? 
Um, I've also designed a, a flow chart. This is really just basically based on our, how do I enable um, WebEx on my network if you go to our Collab Help portal. But this kind of shows you um, what that chart is missing is some of the vectors. Like uh, if you're configuring a firewall, you need to know what direction the traffic comes in. Um, so the, the WebEx traffic, as you can see, the destination is always uh, UDP 9000 for media, as, assuming that port is open. If not, it was uh, TCP 443, right? Um, likewise, the return media traffic, uh, its source, uh, its destination is, uh, uh, the, it, the, the destination will be the source port over here, right? It returns to the sender. Okay, um, uh, telepresence traffic, as you know, that comes out your expressway. Um, something to be aware of is there is a very large uh, UDP outbound port requirement. Uh, we can't actually narrow this. The cloud um, has a requirement to be, to be able to send media on this entire range. Um, also, in the signal, as you know, we signal basically on 5060 for unsecure, 5061 for secure, and we also use 5065 for mutual TLS. Uh, but we do ask that you have that entire range open just because we may use additional ports in that range at some point. And, and likewise, the return traffic uh, returns to the sender. One, one thing to be aware of this, um, does, do you guys know what SIP reinvite is? Does that ring a bell? Anybody heard of that? Like, it's basically like a mid-call reinvite. Um, one issue we have sometimes with uh, CMR traffic is when we first have the call go into WebEx, uh, there is going to be a reinvite in the reverse direction on a different session number. So depending on the configuration of this firewall, it may block that traffic because most common firewall rules permit, you know, outbound anything, right? And they block inbound, uh, you know, darn near anything that wasn't already an existing outbound session is kind of a default behavior. So um, do make sure that you do enable um, UDP 5060 if you're doing insecure calls and also 5061 for secure calls, just in the inbound direction and just to the external address of this expressway. You know, we're not asking you to open up um, your entire network. Um, we're, we're just asking you to trust the expressway as being able to uh, be hardened um, you know, via our um, hardening configuration to be exposed um, and being, being basically being able to answer calls, right? If you don't have that port 5060 or 5061 open to the outside, you can't receive a call anyways, right? Uh, you would only be able to do outbound calls, but we can't do the mid-call reinvite. And if that isn't open, uh, the, the symptom is I, I place a call into WebEx, after 30 seconds, the call drops. Um, and uh, media wasn't working the entire time because it was blocked. Okay, um, I just stole this from our expressway deployment guide. Uh, if you look at uh, how it works, is we have a, a single, um, uh, what do you call it, a traversal port between the expressway and the control, and outbound, uh, this is the large exposed interface, and you have the, say, inside address number one, the outside address number two, which itself has a NAT, and this is the NAT configuration on the expressway, you know, for its outside address. So it knows what its inside address and outside address are. Um, so if you, if you haven't seen this before, just refer to the expressway documentation. Um, this is just a slide uh, I think that you'll see in other sessions this week, if you want. Um, I think one of my colleagues, uh, Kevin Rorty, is doing a session on WebEx Edge, or uh, the ex expressway Edge. Sorry, not the WebEx Edge, Expressway Edge, and basically describes how you implement uh, security in layers. And you can use either simply get rid of unauthenticated uh, traffic and all your problems go away. Uh, if you're in, but if you permit uh, unauthenticated traffic, you have to uh, you know, both filter on ACL, on search rules, and um, use a calling search space, say, because the most common um, problem that we get with Expressways would be unauthenticated traffic basically comes in to your UCM environment and then bounces off to do long distance toll fraud calls, you know, all day long. So if you prevent um, this type of traffic from making um, outbound calls, just say, hey, if you have an unauthenticated traffic, that's fine. The range of numbers that you're permitted to dial would be, say, um, I don't know, video conferencing gear because we're trusting that you're probably a call that understands uh, my dial plan and is hitting one of my conference rooms. But if your goal is to actually just bounce off and hang up a phone call to 
you know, um, Australia for the next eight hours, you know, we'll block you and just by a search, a, a search space rule. Okay. Any, anybody seen this picture before? No? Uh, Activision Pitfall. I spent way too many hours playing that when I was probably about eight. <laughs> um, but this was just a summary maybe of what I mentioned uh, earlier regarding um, some of the common problems that we get. So deep packet inspection, uh, we officially say uh, that we don't support uh, just because we don't like it. Uh, we only use WebEx clients with TLS, uh, you know, encryption, and also our media itself is encrypted. We've, we're, we're double encrypted and we're only ever talking to the WebEx cloud. Our traffic can't get intercepted. If you're also performing deep packet inspection, all you're really doing is just slowing down the traffic and potentially um, lowering video quality depending on the performance of your box. So whenever I go into an environment and I just have persistently poor um, WebEx meeting client connections, my first assumption is that there's probably something like deep packet inspection going on in the firewall. Okay, and then um, uh, in, my, in my TAC career, um, is anybody familiar with uh, SIP protocol fix up or 323 fix up in firewalls? Have you guys heard about that? Um, it's a built-in solution um, that a lot of firewall vendors have to only permit valid uh, messages uh, being sent and received as SIP. So if somebody's trying to do a SIP or 323-based attack, what it's trying to say is basically just that, um, okay, this SIP conversation, even if it's encrypted, I can still see the SIP header messages and I can say that this is a call, this is a, a hang up, this isn't just like some random probing or attacks, you know, um, on, uh, you know, from SIP participants. Um, it probably is okay, but I think it's actually not necessary because if you look at that prior chart, um, what you're actually, what SIP um, and 323 protocol fix up inspection is doing is really just validating the traffic that's going from here to here, um, which you've already configured and you've already hardened via our guides and doesn't actually need any assistance in determining whether or not the 323 messages are valid. We actually run all this stuff on our box. Uh, we're making sure that this is valid communication for you. We don't need a firewall to also do it. And so some of the potential pitfalls are, um, you know, traffic gets disconnected, um, it decides that it doesn't like uh, what it sees, um, and uh, there can be all kinds of very hard to diagnose problems, okay? We try to stay away from that. Um, <clears throat> another, another couple things to worry about would be uh, ALGs, as was mentioned, application layer gateways, same idea, uh, slow down the media, not necessary. Um, net reflection is an interesting one. Um, if you ever have an expressway deployment and it only has one um, NIC interface, uh, there can be a problem known as NAT reflection, seen as an attack by a firewall, because what that means is if I only have one interface on my expressway, what it has to do is a loop. It goes out on the inside address to the firewall. Uh, the firewall gives it its external NAT address. It returns to the expressway and then goes out again. Question? Just on the E. Uh, I'm sorry, one of the requirements is two. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, I know you could. I, I think it's impossible to deploy an expressway with one interface. <laughs> yeah, you can, but it's almost impossible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Hopefully you never need to hear about this. Like, I never want to hear one of these problems ever again. But if you have an expressway with a single interface, you may have this problem with your firewall. Yeah, good question. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I, I wrote some articles on our, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, both internally and externally on this particular topic. So if you don't want to end up like this poor guy, like hopefully that was scuttled and not an accident, but I'm afraid it was an accident. I hope nobody got hurt, but anyways, I thought it looked kind of funny. Um, if you have calls that are disconnecting on well-known intervals, we almost automatically know what the problem is. Like if I get a call and a customer says, hey Joe, um, my calls are hanging up every 60 minutes. Like have you ever heard of this symptom? The call stays up for 60 minutes, disconnects. What could it be? Um, what it basically is, is um, 
somewhere in the chain um, between, um, if I go back here, somewhere in the chain, almost always right here between this expressway and this firewall, and very often maybe another firewall that you don't see, some of the SIP timers are not aligned. It's either the SIP timers or the TCP timers. So the TCP timers go all the way from the endpoint to the UC manager or uh, expressway call control. Um, they all need to have their timers aligned. And so Cisco has done you know, uh, the job of setting all of our default timers to 60 minutes. And so uh, the third party devices, such as the firewall, also need to have their um, TCP and SIP timers set to exactly the same. If they aren't aligned, we can get this kind of problem because what that means is somebody might be sending a keep alive and based on our timer, we don't think that we need to return a keep alive to that person. And so um, the session can get torn down uh, just based on a misalignment of timers. Because uh, say if the firewall is set to a 30 minute timer and ours is set to the default 60 minutes, at 30 minutes, uh, the firewall might say, hey guys, uh, I know there's a call up on here, but uh, are you still using this port? You know, uh, where's your keep alive? And we're like, I don't know, man. Um, I don't owe you anything for another 30 minutes. And so the firewall goes, hey, uh, it's about that time. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to drop this connection. Too bad. Get, get lost. And then that's the symptom we get. So you'll have to spend uh, a hop by hop in your, um, um, uh, hop by hop, uh, d uh, you know, um, analysis of all the various points where uh, the media and the signaling go through your network. Usually it's just endpoint, call manager, um, expressway, firewall. Uh, somewhere in there, somebody's timer is not aligned. And um, if you look at our Collab Help uh, portal, there's a number of articles on this topic. Okay. Okay, just some to do's. All right, QoS and uh, WebEx is also a, a, good, to a, a good topic. Uh, I enjoy this one. So I've stolen some of the thunder a little bit. I've described um, how QoS uh, tagging already works. This is just a reminder. This is just a different way of looking at the same problem. So the Teams client, uh, we like to use it as a good example of what to do. Um, we put uh, per our SRND, has anyone seen the uh, uh, SRND uh, for QoS in collaboration? Anybody read it? No? <laughs> this is where that comes from. There's a, there's a design guide on you know, how to categorize and classify and how to maintain media, you know, in your network. And so we're just following along. Uh, we're doing the same thing. So we have audio, video clearly defined. And this is just signaling, right? So like signaling traffic uh, is in the best effort, effort scavenger class. So the meeting client, as I was saying, um, doesn't have uh, differentiation. Um, so one thing you could do is apply a single um, policy to both audio and video which might not be a great idea. Uh, the other thing to do would be to say, allow your network intelligence, um, NBAR and DNA to do the categorization for you. Otherwise, you could go and manually build an ACL to use the source port of this big range and to put everything into one category. Um, you know, either way you do it, uh, you'd probably get yelled at. Uh, you could define it, everything as audio. Uh, which might disrupt audio. You could define everything as video, which might disrupt the audio within your um, WebEx clients. If you're using out-of-band audio, such as PSTN, you know, cellular, uh, then maybe you wouldn't need to worry about this and you could put everything in the video class and succeed that way. Um, why does this matter? Um, I don't know if you've, have you guys seen this chart before? Uh, this is just the uh, ITU recommendations on latency and how it affects voice and video. We have a really, really tight range um, for success. This is why QoS matters. Um, basically, these are, consider these MOS scores, like five, four, three, two, one. Um, and look how sensitive we are to latency. MOS score of one, this is a completely the worst call I've ever had in my life. I can't hear a damn thing. Right around 550 milliseconds of latency. And then I think business quality probably exists right about here. This is the absolute bottom of uh, business quality. So if you get a 300 millisecond total latency, um, that's the absolute limit. And if you want to have like excellent audio, look how tight that is. So just for uh, voice, 
they need to stay within 150 milliseconds, and for video, you know, we get a little bit more, 200. Um, so we don't have a lot of time to play with. If you look at how the traffic goes from end to end, we also have path latency, right? The speed of light, the network switches, internet providers, queuing, forwarding. We have encoding and decoding, and we have buffers. So about maybe half of this budget is used just to encode and decode the audio and video. And then that doesn't leave us much for the path latency. And that's why the direct connect can do nothing but improve things. So if you look at, like, say, typical path latency, I think you could say, at least in the United States, the number we use for path latency from, say, Los Angeles to New York, um, it's going to be around 40 milliseconds. So, you know, on a high-speed connection, that's the best you can do. And so, you know, we kind of bump up uh, a big chunk of our budget. And then through encoding and decoding, you know, we're going to use another 80 milliseconds. So we barely have any room if you're going coast to coast to stay under this threshold. If there's any additional problems, um, your users are going to notice it. And so the most common place to actually have problems would be on the customer side. Um, so where QoS can be really important, right, is on the customer side when the traffic is trying to get to the, uh, say, the service provider, uh, just to make sure that it's in the priority queue and ahead of data. Like if there's congestion on the customer side, we want to be in a preferred class. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned that I would uh, share some of these stats. So this is a stat that uh, shows how important UDP connections are to the WebEx client. Um, when, when we're UDP connected, um, we get good results um, uh, all the way um, up to about 2%. And right when users can notice problems, say, hey, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the meeting's OK. But you know, every once in a while, I see like a little video hiccup, or maybe the video quality is impacted. We can go all the way to about six to eight percent, and the users are still really happy with the meeting. But they're saying, "But I can see something though." So that's a that's a great tolerance. You know, also the latency that they can tolerate under UDP is really really high. If we're TCP connected, though, look how dramatically different that is. Only up to about two percent um, can a TCP connected person still say, mm, OK, I'm in the meeting. It's still good. It's OK. Uh, but I do notice something beyond 2%, they will start to complain, which is why we build that other chart on the, um, you know, the, the problematic video at right around the 2% packet loss window. And uh, Teams client is actually even better. Uh, it can go all the way up to about 10%. So that's kind of a crazy amount of, of packet loss to just ignore. Okay, um, rate adaption. So there's, there's three basic strategies that we have in media. If I were um, ha having this discussion with you guys maybe even as early as five years ago, we would have said something like, um, here's Cisco's way of deciding how to ensure video quality. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna provision the network, we're gonna get all the queues right, we're gonna get all the traffic tagging right, and then we're going to have a dedicated circuit or a relationship with a service provider, and we will establish, say, end-to-end, -end, um, you know, uh, uh, magic pipes as far as ensured delivery, guaranteed bandwidth, and uh, tested and engineered to perfection. Uh, that was what we had with our telepresence system. Um, and, but there's been a lot of important developments since then. We decided those types were not we. Uh, customers have decided that those circuits are way too expensive. Uh, customers have decided um, that, you know, um, maybe good enough is good enough. And then uh, there's also been the rise of net neutrality, which means uh, my data isn't necessarily more important than somebody else's data, even if I'm tagging it with EF class, you know, for audio, because I actually can't tolerate um, loss or it's terrible. But I guess everyone has decided, well, what happens if everyone tags their traffic EF? We're back in the exact same problem. What if it's not really audio traffic and people just signal for higher priority? Uh, what if people misuse the system? You know, what if, what if data is actually as important as audio? You know, how do we decide? So everyone threw their hands up and said, I don't know how to tell you how to decide. Maybe everyone's traffic is equal. So uh, rate adaption is one of the um, requirements to succeed um, in uh, any kind of a media deployment. So basically, there's two methods. Either we use receiver reports, where the receiver says, hey, based on um, 
the, the packet uh, source numbers, uh, I'm noticing that I'm missing a few in the sequence or they're coming in out of order. Can you slow down? You know, you're killing me. And so they'll respond to the receiver reports. There's also the sender reports, uh, which are just based on, um, um, you know, the, uh, the, the return traffic not arriving in time. And so um, a third option would be like a predictive method. But basically the, 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 the real result of this is we either have to downspeed, uh, back off, and uh, there's also upspeed, right? Upspeed is the other alternative to this. If everything's going well, we can climb back up the ladder and go back to video quality after a problem has occurred. And um, media resilience, uh, this is a great graphic. As long as the packet dropouts are basically consistent, um, we can use forward error correction, right? That's been around for quite a while. Uh, use forward error correction, uh, as long as it's not too bursty, um, this will work. So we also use um, media resilience as a, the second key part of how we maintain video quality in WebEx. That's why, you know, in that 6% range of packet loss that, you know, it's gonna be hard for somebody to know that there's a problem because we're doing um, forward error correction. But you don't wanna use too much because then bandwidth becomes a problem. So if you put it all together, if you're using rate adaption, media resilience, and you design the network uh, using QoS and DSCP values, so at least on the customer prem, uh, their traffic is optimized and not subject to drops on the customer side, that's the best of both worlds. Um, so the codecs are loss resilient, the codecs can downspeed and upspeed, and they adapt to changing network conditions, and we engineer the network so that they don't experience congestion, at least on the way out. Okay, and then so how do customers deploy this today? Uh, you could do it in three different layers. You could just do the UDP port ranges. That's the easiest thing to do. So you identify the source and destination, tag your traffic, off you go, you're done. Uh, DSCP trust would be uh, the higher network layers. Let's use, um, let's use the network intelligence, NBAR. Um, uh, let's get the, uh, uh, the traffic uh, trusted between the clients and the network. And we can also do a policy, you know, from our SDN, um, you know, equipment. SDN can actually build a dynamic policy and distribute it all the way to the various switches and access layers uh, that enforces this policy of what traffic gets optimized and where. Okay, and then um, just an example of when this doesn't work. Like, let's say that uh, you um, have a, a media application and you're monitoring your latency, and uh, let's say that there's congestion. In this example, I have a 100% link utilization, right? Like somebody is streaming from Netflix or uh, torrenting from a peer-to-peer -peer network and downloading stuff, and it's using absolutely 100% of the bandwidth. What does the latency look like in media? You'll see this sort of thing. The um, buffers basically do a starve and uh, clear and refresh. So basically you get a, like a Y equals X uh, latency increasing from about 200 milliseconds to whatever the depth of the buffer is, and then it'll crash. And this would be like a huge packet loss moment, uh, and then we restart. And this happens over and over again. So this would be an example where QoS isn't deployed. You get this spiking latency. And then um, another one would be, okay, if I'm not just um, a single stream, uh, we have many shared streams, you're gonna get a ringing function that'll look like this, where we peg the latency, uh, like say if you have additional connections, the latency will peg and bounce around whatever the peak buffer is, and the queue actually never empties. That would be the other thing. If you just see consistent and steady high latency, that just means that you have a, uh, a buffer in a switch that's basically servicing multiple clients and it's completely tapped out. Um, and I think no, no discussion on um, um, QoS would be complete without Wi-Fi. Uh, I think, uh, would you guys agree that uh, Wi-Fi is maybe the biggest source of trouble in this environment at most enterprises? Okay. So um, we are doing some um, proprietary stuff with uh, Apple that you might have heard of called like Fastlane. Uh, there's a bunch of other technologies in this space, um, and it's all been out for a while, and you can take advantage of it. Like some of the things that Fastlane provides would be, uh, you know, like priority access for various applications on Wi-Fi, because Wi-Fi um, has um, the, the problem that it's really not 
full duplex, right? It's what they use is multiple channels and multiple antennas to try to kind of fake or mimic uh, a full duplex transaction. But uh, they usually tend to have additional latency and additional problems, basically, with media. Um, the other problem might be in access points. Um, most clients only look for the closest access point. They don't necessarily look for the best access point that has the most throughput. And they also have problems, say, switching from one access point to the next, which you probably are pretty familiar with, like in cellular networks, too. There's always some kind of an awkward handoff, I think, if you're mid-call, that can occur still. Um, Fastlane and our Wi-Fi teams are working on a lot of these things. If you want to take a look, uh, we do have a bunch of design guides for how to deploy QoS in Wi-Fi networks. Um, and just maybe also pay particular attention to the Apple devices, because um, we can take those maybe to the next level. Okay, And I, I, I would imagine there's a, uh, I didn't put it in our session, but I'm sure from the, um, uh, the wireless uh, teams here this week, uh, just pay them a visit, and they know this uh, far better than I. Okay, so um, takeaways, um, Macs do this today. Uh, the Windows, oh, I didn't say why Windows uh, can't do um, this today. It's because uh, Microsoft has a policy where if you write to the um, application or the device layer that sets the DSCP values, it just has a policy that that requires admin rights. And like as I was saying earlier, um, we have a requirement in our uh, client. Um, we do not want it to require admin rights to install ever, so um, we can't uh, permit it to do that. <clears throat> so this doesn't mean that you can't build a, uh, there's a way to do this manually yourself. There's a thing called the group policy editor, and you can go into the group policy editor and define a profile that you distribute to all your Windows PCs, right? And you can say, okay, if it's the WebEx meeting or the WebEx desktop app client, you know, put it into this queue and to tag its traffic in these various layers. So you can use the GPO editor to assign it. Uh, if not, like as I was saying, do it in the network. NBAR2 has a built-in um, uh, profile for it. So all the various ISR, <laughs> Nexus switches, including Meraki APs and other wireless APs, they can all run NBAR. So as long as you're at a switch or a access that uses NBAR, you can do it. Um, DNAC also has WebEx profiles. And um, uh, teams, uh, cloud registered endpoints, do this by themselves automatically. So you don't need to worry about the teams environment. Um, not to worry. And uh, the video mesh node is doing it too. Okay, any, um, any cues on QoS? I only have one more section. Uh, split it as like, um, like what do you mean, like a, oh, in the port ranges? Yeah, I think we could just say it's a design flaw in uh, the WebEx client. Like it really should have split the ranges so that you could, like the question was why doesn't the WebEx client, you know, do what the Teams uh, application did? Um, when, so we 100% agree that that's the way that it should be done. But as it turns out, um, the entire WebEx, like classic meetings platform is built on that behavior and um, re-engineering that is actually um, a rather extensive effort. And so um, we're taking baby steps as far as being able to fix that completely. So it's the same issue with the existing meeting server. So it's CMA app, it's just yeah, oh, CMS. Yeah, CMS has the same issue? OK, I didn't know that. OK. Yeah, uh, yeah and CMS has its own idea around media optimization and so forth. It probably thinks that oh, we'll just do it in the first two layers. Like, we'll do rate adaption and um, yeah, media resilience. You know, uh, we'll use that method to survive. But I would agree that you also need the third. You know, you need to do the um, manual QoS marking and um, rising audio and video traffic to higher queues. Because if you do encounter congestion, it's just a good idea. Yeah. Or just throw bandwidth at it. Right. <laughs> That's the other way. Like, I, I think one takeaway that I don't think I have here is if you don't experience congestion anywhere, none of this actually matters, right? Like, this only matters when you have uh, queuing congestion. So, like, QoS doesn't do anything, traffic optimization doesn't help unless packets are being dropped in your uh, 
various access layers, or most commonly, like your egress router to the service provider, will be running at 80% to 100% and dropping packets, right? Okay, then it will help. Okay, um, web proxies, my, my <laughs> final topic. Thanks for, thanks for hanging in there with me. <laughs> so uh, web proxies is um, my final topic for the day on deploying WebEx because I don't think we can talk about uh, deploying WebEx without talking about um, how proxies work. So would you guys agree that you have a lot of enterprise customers that might have a policy such as this one? If you're connecting to the internet, you're gonna do it through the proxy and nothing else. Is that fair? <laughs> right. Like, I don't care what you're doing, I'm making you go through the proxy. That's uh, really, really common, I think. So I just wanted to give you a, an example of what uh, our, our client is doing. And the client doesn't have to look like this. I think I used the wrong picture. That's like a prior release, but the, the basic application flow uh, hasn't changed. First thing we do, we, somebody clicked on a meeting invite. So it's like some site.webex.com. So just like any HTTP request, it goes to the proxy. And so the proxy um, is actually going to um, now uh, decide to forward this request to the actual um, WebEx site, right? And then the next thing you'll get is, uh, let's say that you um, just went to the WebEx site and I didn't actually click on a meeting, then it's gonna say, hey, what meeting ID? Or if I clicked on the meeting itself, what it's gonna do is try to authenticate me and do the single sign-on and it'll intercept that through the proxy. But in this case, let's just say I'm just joining the WebEx site and all I need to do is enter the uh, meeting ID. So after we enter the, the meeting ID, now what this client is gonna try to do is we actually open up a number of media connections. Like we discussed, we discussed those earlier in the call, but I need to open this WebEx page, I need to open a connection to WebEx chat, WebEx file, if somebody's doing desktop share, if somebody's opening up their camera, we connect to these uh, collaboration media servers. If you do like a TCP stat on a client device connecting to WebEx, you're gonna see up to eight connections to the WebEx environment itself, and every single one of these needs to go through the proxy, right? So, um, and once we either authenticate to the proxy, if proxy authentication is turned on, um, we can go ahead and join the meeting, and then um, all the flows, like we connect to the proxy, and the proxy connects to WebEx, and it transfers all the flows back uh, to the customer successfully, right? So that's just an overview of the proxy environment. If you wanted a visual of what does proxy authentication look like, so like pretend this is the proxy uh, and this is just a, a router in the network. Once I make my outbound attempt, basically, uh, we will either be directly intercepted, like if it's transparent, or I may have a proxy configuration file that tells me and by explicit instructions this is the proxy you need to use. Um, and if I use, say, Kerberos, right, that's like default Windows authentication requests. Um, if I successfully authenticate, then I'm permitted to contact the internet and I can continue my sessions. Uh, if I don't, um, then I'm just dropped. Now, um, some of the things to talk about would be proxy bypass methods. Um, so one of the things you can do is I can say this device IP address can be hard coded in the proxy and it can be permitted to go and I can um, also build a whitelist of URLs, say if you're connecting to those whitelist URLs, so you can either use the source or the destination to build whitelists to say, okay, if in this proxy, um, if you use one of these devices or one of these destinations, you know, go ahead and go forth. Um, but one of the things that you um, uh, might get pushback from would be the customer saying, hey, um, uh, you know what we actually need to do? is this whitelist thing you're talking about? No, uh, you need to work with our security teams and uh, you need to um, actually sit down with us and tell us exactly what your media flows are, what your application's doing. We need to talk about um, you know, how everything works, right? I'm not gonna whitelist everything. We still have a proxy. You still have to go through the proxy and we can't just let you bypass. But that doesn't mean that we can't ask for it, right? Um, uh, I couldn't say just how many times that we've learned that a lot of companies do have a exception process on their InfoSec team. So they might come to you and say, look, everything absolutely has to go through the proxy. Everything must be um, configured uh, to use it. 
no traffic will bypass it whatsoever. But after talking with them, maybe for a few days or weeks or months, you know, we can talk about the business uh, importance of this traffic. We can talk about our own uh, security systems that are in place. We can discuss, you know, like what controls are available in WebEx, right? Like if you have a hard requirement, like files can't be shared, desktops can't be shared, um, you know, various things that you can't do. WebEx is purpose built to be, uh, to give the enterprise control over these capabilities. So we can probably deploy it in a way that's successful. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't work with a proxy, right? We, we absolutely can. But uh, one of the things you might want to request is just an exception. Like, hey, um, can we either make a pack file entry and say, let's exclude WebEx? Can we just have bypass for all the WebEx destination subnets, right? If you look, and we have an article that says, uh, and we don't update it very frequently, uh, but we give you notification if it changes, um, just update these tunnel, update these addresses and off you go, right? Um, so you can either just uh, bypass the sources or the destinations, um, either in uh, the DNS way or um, IP address. Um, the, other, the other problem that goes hand in hand with the strict proxy requirement would be the internal only DNS. Uh, would you say that you also have customers with internal only DNSs as well? and maybe they don't actually allow um, direct public lookups. I don't know if that's more of an American thing or a European thing, or maybe it's an everything thing. Um, but we, d we definitely have a bunch of customers that have this requirement. Um, so basically they say, so um, we have like a holistic security method for DNS that you'll see in some of our other sessions on the security side. Uh, they have a whole way of securing and controlling DNS, but a real simple way to deal with this is WebEx in our data centers, we have our own name servers that can answer the 20,000 some odd media servers and audio ser bridges that we, we host in our data centers. We are the authority servers and they are in our WebEx data center ranges. So even if you have an internal only DNS and everything must require a proxy, in their internal only DNS, what you could say is something that is looking for a WebEx.com address set up a forwarder and the forwarder doesn't go to the public internet, you just go to our primary and secondary uh, authority name servers for WebEx.com. So if they're trying to get a WebEx.com address, all they need to use is just the two forwarders that are hosted in WebEx. So hopefully that'll be a condition because the problem that occurs is, um, you know, failures to join meetings, of course, right? Depending on uh, if the customer attempts to host the WebEx DNS names themselves, they might be able to get, um, uh, they might be able to get, um, say, the initial pages to load. But as soon as we go to the media servers, that list is rather extensive. I think it's almost impossible for a customer to try to attempt to uh, maintain that list. And operationally, we change that list very frequently. So our only recommendation is to use our name server so that when the client does a check, who's my closest media server, that it's available, because trying to host that themselves would be impossible. Um, here, here's an example that you might see. Um, there's a the thing called ICAP, which is basically you know, context uh, recognition. Um, if you ever get a, a client that says, uh, I'm trying to join the meeting and I get hung up and stuck at a certain percentage value, who knows what that percentage value is, they possibly have a proxy that's doing ICAP, you know, context scanning. It appears to be like streaming to the network when the client is joining and the file never completes, so the ICAP never actually releases the connection, because it's trying to say, is this YouTube? You know, I got to this long list of traffic and I never quite got to the end. It's actually the WebEx meeting join process. You know, that's one thing to watch out for. Um, WebEx recordings inaccessible um, is another um, slightly less common, uh, but still valid proxy uh, intercept problem. <laughs> The WebEx recording player is a unique device and does have um, independent certificates that it uses different from the WebEx client. So if all of our testing and verification had to do with the WebEx client and the meeting join process, you still may have a problem playing WebEx recordings using our network-based recording player just because it is a different entity and itself would have to be permitted. You know, it's possible that they're blocking it too. Okay. Um, this is a great eye chart on what versions of proxy authentication all the various devices support. So for the purpose of my presentation, I'm talking about WebEx, desktop, and client. 
So all the basic uh, authentication methods we support, uh, TLS inspecting, um, it's kind of weird, you know, like where you use the, the man in the middle certificate, you know, some companies might have that requirement. We, we hope that you don't, um, but uh, we don't have it. Um, the Teams client does, however. Uh, they can pin a certificate and you can do TLS inspecting with it. Uh, that's just a reference. The, the article exists elsewhere. Okay, um, and I think that was the end of my presentation. Um, just a, a takeaway is remember there is the room. Um, I'll be active in that room and I'll add some <coughs> folks from my team as well as engineering to answer any questions you have. And I think it says that it, we stop monitoring it in a week. No, I'm gonna, I'll be, I'll be watching it for months. So ask me anything, <laughs> uh, I'm here to help. Um, also please com uh, complete your um, survey. Uh, we use that to figure out what we did right, what we should have done instead, um, and just your thoughts on what you'd like to see maybe next time. Um, and I, I thank your attention for staying to the end. Uh, uh, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, I love discussing WebEx deployments. And if you have any questions, I can take them. We, we did finish slightly early, and I have a pack of stuff to hand out. <laughs> if you come visit me, I'll hand you something. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much for your time, and I hope this was useful. Okay. Thank you.